Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, church. My name is Andrew. I'm the minister at St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church at Flemington. And welcome to our YouTube channel. If this is your first time joining us, we uh, welcome you to get connected. Look at the links down below. You can see our Facebook, our Instagram, our website, and we'd love to get to know you better. Uh, we're continuing our series on 1 Peter. And we've spent actually eight sermons so far on 1 Peter. The plan is to hopefully, hopefully finish the rest of the book in four sermons. And so we're going to look at bigger chunks today, and we're going to go straight into it. I'm going to read, and then I'm going to pray. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, to chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. This is God's Word. A beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should, be, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, gentle but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful to, of God. One endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, you do, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ has also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, entrust, continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree, that, was, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Likewise, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adore themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him at Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weak, weaker's vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen, and may God bless the hearers of his words. Uh, let's pray. Oh, gracious God, as we navigate through this difficult passage, we pray that you would equip us to live in this hostile world for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that particular reading, that passage, uh, was interesting to you. It, it really deals with questions like, should you listen to our Premier Daniel Andrews, even if you don't like him? Or questions like, should you suffer under your horrible boss when they are a bully? Or maybe questions like, how should you navigate through difficult mass marriages? You know, I don't have all the answers, but there are helpful guides for us in this particular passage on very important topics in life. If you were here with us last time, we saw that we are to build our life and identity on Jesus Christ. We saw those beautiful words, right? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. The good news of Jesus, the gospel, changes lives, and it changes our lives in a very practical way. And so in our long reading today, we see Peter talk about how Christians are to live as the people of God in this hostile world. And he specifically talks about how we're to submit as citizens of this world, as servants to worldly masters, and how husbands and wives are to interact with each other. There is a lot of what to do. But before we look at the what, may I suggest today we need to look at the why. We need to look closely at the motivation because we could spend a lot of time dealing with the complex situations that we have in this world. But I think it would be more helpful with the short time that we have to ground ourselves on the why of the passage and allow these principles to guide our living and thinking in this world. We're going to ask two main questions today. Why should Christians live differently? And then we're going to look at how should Christians live differently, briefly. So why should Christians live differently? Let me give five reasons, and we'll spend a majority of our time on these things. Uh, verse 11 and 12, they give us two pleas. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Verse 11, meaning keep away from sinful desires, do not indulge in them. And that includes anger, impatience, lack of kindness, lust, envy, sexual temptation, pride, greed, a lack of love of God. And the list goes on. And Peter says, abstain from these things, run from them. And then verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. How you present yourself and interact with others, unbelievers, matters. In the very so in the very beginning of our little section, we're given a lot of what to do. Uh, such a command implies that inward desires are not uncontrollable, but can be consciously nurtured or restrained. That's why we need rebuke. Uh, don't use your habits and inclinations as an excuse for sin. 
oh, I'm naturally a lazy person. Oh, I'm naturally angry. Oh, I'm naturally stubborn. Peter says, abstain from these things. Or Paul elsewhere says, put to death sin. We can and must put to death sin and unrighteousness. Why? Why should we apply these things to our lives? Because souls are at stake. Why should Christians live differently? Well, Peter firstly says in verse 11, souls are at stake and there is a war happening. The ultimate issue in that verse is that the human soul is in danger of being destroyed. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. If the war is successful souls are lost. That's why we need to take sin seriously. And I think about Jesus who says in Matthew 16, 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Sometimes we think living sinfully is okay if it's not a big deal. Let me be angry for a few hours. Let me indulge in this lustful, envious, greedy thing. Let me be proud, let me be unkind to the person today because they deserve it. And we might justify all these uh, sinful habits and um, lifestyles with all different reasons. But Peter helps us put the Christian life into perspective. No sin is harmful. No sin is not harmless. It's harmful. It's in fact dangerous. It wages war on your soul. And so all of us this morning, afternoon, evening, needs to look at our hearts, look at our lives, and maybe, maybe some of the excuses we've made in the past, and repent and run to God, and run away from sin. There is a dangerous war, and we are to live differently. That's the first reason why Christians live differently. Souls are at stake, and there's a war happening. Uh, The second reason why Christians are to live differently is found in verse 12. He tells us to conduct ourselves honorably among the Gentiles, even when they speak evil against us. And the purpose for it is found at the end of verse 12. Uh, Did you see it? That they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The second great reason is mentioned in verse 12. The issue of the glory of God. We live differently so that even when people mistreat us and as we respond in honorable or excellent ways, God is glorified. It matters how we act. The goal of our human behavior is for the glory of God. And so we should be mindful of how we talk, how we walk, how we interact with others for God's glory. Our lives point people to how good and great and gracious God is. And so it's not shocking then when the Bible is full of passages of practical things to do. When our lives look differently, it's a reflection of the eternal, internal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It shows the world that we practice what we preach. We really believe it. And so the second great reason for why Christians are to live differently is because of the glory of God. Uh, Thirdly, we're to live differently because it is God's will for your life. And you'll see that in a number of passages. Verse 13, be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. Verse 15, for this is the will of God. Verse 19, mindful of God. Verse 20, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And then when talking about wives submitting to husbands, in chapter 3, verse 4, it is God's, it is in God's sight very precious. God cares how we live and how we interact with people. As some people Sometimes we might think God doesn't really mind the small things in life. Only the big things matter. Yet here in this passage, Peter shows us God cares and he is very interested in our daily lives. That's a good thing. 
Um, he, he, he's not like a tyrant overshadowing your every move. Rather, he is our heavenly, kind Father who wants the best for us and wants us to live a life pleasing to him. I, I, I always tell Ezra why I do things. I always say, because daddy loves you. He might not like everything I do. Uh, when I stop him from hurting himself or stop him from doing whatever he wants, but I'm interested in his life and want the best for him because I love him. Although now he uses that against me and every time he wants something, he says, because daddy loves me. Uh, unlike human fathers who fail all the time and don't get it right, God is perfect. God's way is the best way. And our Heavenly Father knows what's best for us. And so thirdly, we're to live differently because it's God's will for you. Fourthly, we're to live differently because Christ has set us free. Verse 16, in the challenging passage about how we live under worldly authorities, Peter says, live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. If you are in Jesus, Christ has set you free from the bondage of sin and what the law demands. And now we live our lives for God and we are servants of God. <laughs> as servants of God, as free people, how we interact with others change because we look to Jesus as the perfect example. And so that leads me to the final and most central reason why we're to live differently. Christ has set us free, and now we look to Christ, our example. And so if you look at verse 21 to 25, sandwiched between all the what to do's, Peter says, for this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow his steps. And he goes on to talk about Christ's suffering, Christ's sacrifice, Christ's servanthood, Christ's death. And although he is king, he did not come to, serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Although living under worldly leaders or bosses and other relationships can lead to suffering, it's an opportunity to reflect Christ's life. Our suffering reflects Christ's suffering. Jesus suffered not for his own sake, but for the sake of God's purpose and for the salvation of others. As we follow him, we suffer for his sake and for the sake of winning others for, to his saving gospel. And as we meditate on Christ's suffering and death, we remind ourselves in verse 24 that he did this so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And so you see those five reasons. Five reasons why Christians should live differently. There's a war with souls at stake. It's for God's glory, because it's God's will for your life, because Christ has set you free, and because of Christ's example. I hope these five reasons compel you to live differently, even when it's hard, even when suffering is involved. As we follow Christ, we suffer for his sake and for the sake of winning others to his saving gospel. And now with the last few minutes we have, we need to tackle how we are to live differently. Oh, we, we, we could look at the infinite amount of situations, but as we meditate on those five whys, look at the applications and think about it. Verse 11, abstain from the passions of the flesh. How we are to live differently? Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Verse 13 and 14, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be emperor or as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to pray those who do good. Verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good, 
um, to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And to make a point here, slavery and servants were widespread in Peter's world. It included many who would today be regarded as professionals, managers of estates, physicians, teachers, and tutors. And so as they live under masters, they were called to submission, even to unjust masters. Or chapter 3, wives be subject to your own husbands, so even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external and braid, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayer may not be hindered. And so those are the applications. How are you to live differently? I've already spoken about the importance of putting to death sin and running away from ungodliness. But how do you make of how we deal with the government? How we deal with bosses and leaders? How we navigate through marriages? We might not like some of the things we are called to do in these passages. But that's why we need to remember. Remember all the whys. There's a war with souls at stake. It's for God's glory. It's God's will for your life. Christ has set you free and we're to be an example of Christ's example. We need to remember the whys. If we lose sight on the why, we will find it extremely hard to live in a world affected by sin. And let me make three closing remarks about the how. I hope you caught what I read in verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. The fear of God should be at the center of what you do. And so that means it is not blind submission to authorities. If the authorities tell you to do something that's dishonoring to God, don't fear man, fear God. Wives, some of you may have unbelieving husbands. Some of you might be extreme, in extremely difficult marriages. Maybe you have been hurt already. Maybe some of you have believing husbands who are in sin. May God have mercy on you as you reflect Christ in your relationships. May He give you strength so that by your conduct, by your faith, you may win them over. And for husbands, you have an important task to love like how Christ loved the church. At the end of verse 7, there's an implication that you're meant to be praying for your wives. Or how I pray our church would be filled with husbands and fathers in the church who actively pray for their family. As you reflect Christ in your life, even when it means suffering, and the church would have suffered. As we reflect Christ in the many aspects of this world, oh, may you point people to the saving work of Christ, and may God be glorified. Amen. Let me pray. Oh, gracious God, we ask that you would help us to have great wisdom and strength to navigate through this difficult, hostile, sinful world. We may suffer for the gospel. And as we do, we pray that you would be pleased through our lives and our faith and that people would come to you. So Father, we do commit St. Stephen and all its members to you. We pray for our church and we pray that we would be good examples to the world for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.